Hey there, this is Clay with ModernLove.Life where we help you get the great loving relationship that you want without having to play mind games, without having to play hard to get, and without having to pretend to be someone or something other than who you are because I believe that you deserve to be loved for the person that you are. And if you believe the same thing, please do me a favor by giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel if you are not already. Be sure to hit that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that you can get notifications next time we go live or upload a new video. And if you want to learn more about uh, how to become more emotionally available yourself, which is one of the topics we're gonna to be talking about today, uh, feel free to check out our free class over at modernlove.life slash class. Okay, so today we're talking about emotional unavailability after a breakup. And this is coming after um, doing a couple videos on the topic of rebound relationships. And really, rebound relationships are a symptom of emotional unavailability. So we're gonna be talking about emotional unavailability now. And after a breakup, um, a lot of people, most people, are at least temporarily emotionally unavailable. Um, you know, most people do have the capacity to be emotionally available, um, but because of breakups, they kind of get knocked down into a temporary state of emotional unavailability. There are also people that are in a long-term emotionally unavailable pattern who are just kind of emotionally unavailable in a relationship, emotionally unavailable during the breakup, and then emotionally unavailable in whatever happens next in their life. Um, and so most people are going to be at least temporarily emotionally unavailable after a breakup. And this is normal. You know, a breakup is something that consumes a lot of your emotional energy and a, a lot of your emotional attention. And, um, you know, just like other things in life, like studying for an exam, um, you know, work deadlines, things like that, those can make you emotionally unavailable uh, to a certain extent. Uh, back when I was in grad school and I was really trying to get things done for my thesis, I was probably kind of emotionally unavailable because a lot of my attention was put on my studying, on communicating with my thesis advisor, and so on and so forth. Um, and so emotional unavailability after a breakup is a very, very, very common thing. Um, it just as our attention and focus and energy gets put towards the pain that we're in, the loss that we're experiencing, the regrets about the past, the emotional investment that we put into, what is our ex doing? Why, why are they on, on the rebound? Are they dating somebody? Why, why are they putting up their, their dating profile so soon and all of that stuff? Um, it can make us emotionally unavailable to a certain extent. And when you are in an emotionally unavailable place, it is very easy to end up being drawn into an emotionally un unavailable dynamic with another emotionally unavailable person. It's very easy to be drawn into a rebound relationship. It is very easy to be put in lots of unhealthy situations. So um, oftentimes a lot of people will deal with the pain of a breakup by trying to distract themselves. You know, there are certain schools of thought that say that the no contact rule is a great time for you to distract yourself from the pain of the breakup because time is going to heal all wounds and if you just keep busy by focusing on work, by exercising a lot, by going on dates with other people, by having rebound relationships, then you're going to get over the pain of the breakup or you're going to have enough time pass so that um, you know the magic of no contact will work and your ex will suddenly be an open book to you. Um, but I don't believe that is the case because first of all, you know, if you, th th there's two basic branches of no contact. There's the no contact rule for moving on and doing things to distract yourself is just indulging more in emotional unavailability, which is not helping you move on. And then there's the branch of no contact that is to help you to create a better connection with your ex. And staying in an emotionally unavailable pattern is not going to be demonstrating them uh, demonstrating to them that you are the kind of person that they are ready and willing and excited and eager to commit to. So I do not believe that you should distract yourself from a uh, pain following a breakup by simply just, you know, keeping busy with work, by dating people, by exercising a lot, by doing other things like that. Instead, what I think the most important thing for you to do following a breakup to avoid ending up as an emotionally unavailable person 
um, and to avoid getting locked into that emotional unavailable pattern. Because if you start to engage in emotionally unavailable activities, such as you know getting lost in work, such as exercising a lot, such as um, indulging in rebound relationships, you run the risk of turning that activity into a habit, and that habit becomes sort of part of your personality, and then that personality starts to get cemented into place, and then before you know it, you are actually a long-term emotionally unavailable person um, yourself. And I don't believe that this is something that you would want for yourself, and it's not something that I'd recommend that you do. So I ask that you please do not distract yourself. Please do not try to avoid the pain of heartbreak, of a breakup, by trying to just numb the pain by distracting yourself in one of you know many different ways. Um, but what is important that you do is that you work through these emotions, is that you focus on your own healing and that you really allow yourself to feel the feelings of heartbreak that you're going through, right? It's normal to feel heartbreak after a breakup. It's absolutely normal. I mean, if you were in a relationship with somebody and you actually cared about that person, which is not that much of a stretch, assuming you were in a uh, you know, relationship with that person for a long period of time, you're going to feel a sense of loss. You're going to feel a sense of regret. You're going to feel even frustration or anger or all sorts of different emotions. And if you just let yourself feel those emotions, then those emotions will eventually come to be resolved. And then you don't have to be haunted by them anymore. And you can step forward into whatever the future may hold for you without it becoming uh, some sort of thing haunted by the baggage of the past. So it's really important that you allow yourself to feel your emotions after a breakup. And I know it's not fun. I know it's not fun to feel heartbreak. I know it's not fun to feel, uh, you know, completely depressed and all that stuff. But if you allow yourself to do this without identifying with those emotions, you know, there's a difference between, you know, being depressed and being a person who is feeling depressed or being heartbroken and being a person who is experiencing heartbreak. There's, there's a difference between those. Um, if you allow yourself to do this, then those emotions will become resolved. Um, so don't put the brakes on those emotions. Don't try to avoid them. Just let yourself experience them. Let yourself experience them fully. Do not associate and identify with those emotions. Otherwise, uh, you can start to go down some really unhealthy roads. Uh, but do allow yourself to experience them. And um, of course, don't put the brakes on. Don't try to avoid uh, those, those feelings. Don't try and hide behind things like work or exercise or dating or um, you know, all sorts of other things that you might do, like you know, just going out and partying and drinking too much or anything like that. Because those are going to, they run the risk of turning into emotional addictions of sorts. And I'm not just talking about, you know, like, hey, going out and drinking and suddenly you become an alcoholic. I'm talking about becoming addicted to the sensation of avoiding your emotions, becoming addicted to being emotionally unavailable, becoming addicted to not being present with what's actually happening, becoming addicted to being disengaged from reality and being disengaged from what it is that you actually want to experience and instead being engaged with uh, fantasies, ideals, potential, stuff like that, okay? So what you want to do is you want to really allow yourself to experience whatever it is that you're going through, and that's a great way to start to work through these emotions. And I know this is not easy. This took a while for me when I was going through some pretty rough breakups in the past. You know, I, I worked on expressing these feelings through creative outlets such as um, painting, painting artwork, um, doing things like just going for long walks in nature and all of that stuff just to just to work through the emotions in my mind. I wasn't really, you know, looking at flowers and trees and stuff like that. I was really just kind of working through my own issues in my own mind. But being in nature helped a lot because it was kind of a, a quiet place where there wasn't too much like external noise like you might get in the city. Um, and so that's really a great way that you can go about doing this. Um, and so what you want to do is you want to do this until those emotions do become complete. And this is a journey. This is a journey of self-discovery. This is a journey of um, 
you learning about yourself, you learning about the things in your life that didn't work, the things in your relationship that didn't work. And this is not like something where it's like, okay, I do this and then I'm done, but it, it should ideally become an endless path, a path, a path that takes you to, um, you know, new levels of growth. You know, if you have a breakup, I hope that you don't waste it by just thinking that it's an awful thing that happened and then just hoping to, you know, fumble around into another relationship as the same person. I hope that you take your breakup and say, what didn't work? What was I doing that I could have been doing differently? What is it that I can learn from this situation? How can I take this pain and turn it into a valuable lesson that I can use to have better relationships in the future, to have a greater connection with others in the future, to put me on track to have the kind of loving relationship that I actually want for myself. Okay, so that's how to work through emotional unavailability after a breakup. Once again, if you like what we're doing here, please give me a thumbs up on this video. It helps to support the channel. Uh, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, making sure that you hit that bell icon. And if you want to learn more about how to work through these emotions, how to become less emotionally numb yourself, go check out our free class over at modernlove.life slash class. And if you like what you see over there, I'd also like to invite you to sign up for our other course called the Compatibility Code. And if you don't like what you see there, that's totally fine. But I'm sure you'll probably get something uh, valuable out of the free class anyway. Okay, so with that being said, let's see what folks are talking about. Um, how does an emotionally unavailable man go from treating you poorly and pushing you away to giving good treatment and affection to someone else so soon? How long does the false self um, of availability last? Okay, so an emotionally unavailable man. Okay, let's take a step back here. So in a in a typical emotionally unavailable dynamic, there's actually two emotionally unavailable people. Um, we're just gonna refer to the emotionally unavailable man as a man, although it, it doesn't need to be a man, but classically it's a man, and the emotionally unavailable woman as a woman, even though it doesn't have to be a woman, it just traditionally is a woman, but the, 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 both are actually emotionally unavailable. Uh, the emotionally unavailable man is afraid of commitment. He is searching for the ideal perfect partner, and so he, he oftentimes projects this perfection onto whoever he might be seeing or dating, and he uh, tries to really make the relationship look like his ideals by fast forwarding through the organic uh, nature of building a natural, real emotional foundation. This is often how rebound relationships work. This is often how the displacement that happens in rebound relationships work. Um, you know, as you kind of move through the normal order of a relationship progression very quickly, you know, you might uh, move in together after only a couple weeks when, you know, a sane person might take a couple months or even a year or longer before they do that. You might become engaged after only a couple weeks or a couple months um, when, you know, most people would probably at least date for a year or so before they talk about getting married. Um, this, is, this is the fast forwarding part of the emotionally unavailable process. Now, the other person, the, uh, again, well, just for lack of a better term, the emotionally unavailable woman is wanting this emotionally unavailable man to commit to her. So she probably believes that she is very emotionally available. She probably believes that she is very emotionally available because she is open and available for this emotionally unavailable person to commit to her. But what she does not understand is that she is trying to get an emotionally unavailable person to be someone or something other than what he is. She is hoping that he becomes an available person so that he will commit to her and thus validate her in some way and thus um, you know, contradict whatever issues she's going through about uh, low self-esteem, about lack of worth or something like that, right? But because she is pursuing a relationship with an emotionally unavailable man, that guy is unlikely to actually commit to her, which means that as she becomes closer to him or as she tries to become closer to him or as she pursues him, he's going to become afraid because you know, that's going to limit possibility, that's going to collapse possibility into one option, which is her. Um, of course, she's gonna be imperfect because she's a human. Uh, the emotionally unavailable man wants the perfect partner, so he's not going to want to commit to somebody who is imperfect. He's going to thus pull away, thus causing the emotionally unavailable woman to prove her limiting beliefs and limiting worldviews 
accurately, which is that she's not worthy of love, right? So she wants the unavailable guy to commit to her so that she can prove to herself that she is lovable. But he is unable to commit to her from an emotional level. Thus, he pulls away, thus proving her belief right. Okay, it's kind of a deep thing here, but this is something that we talk about over at uh, the free class and over in the compatibility code as well too. So if this is like going way over your head, definitely check that out. Um, but as the emotionally unavailable man pulls away, you know, he is starting to see that this situation, like all situations, is less than perfect. And so he doesn't want to engage in it because it is less than perfect. And he wants to have the perfect partner, someone who he just knows is the right one for him. Um, but, you know, of course, that's not possible. So as he pulls away, he starts to scan for somebody else that he can start to live out this, again, uh, mental construct in his mind of an ideal partner, of an ideal relationship, right? And things are really easy at the beginning because there's no pressure for a commitment. There's no pressure to make it real. It's just, you know, dating. It's just fun. It's just sleeping around. It's just sex. It's just casual stuff, right? But as soon as it's like, hey, you know, I want a commitment. I want to get married. I want, you know, to, to have a family and all that stuff. That's when the probabilities, the, the infinite probabilities in a relationship, in a dynamic, start to collapse down into real actual things. And that's what scares the emotionally unavailable man because he doesn't like the commitment because he wants the perfection out there, um, which of course is not possible. And any sort of actual thing is going, to, is going to be less than perfect. Any actual committed relationship is going to be less than perfect. Any actual marriage is going to be less than perfect. Any actual um, commitment of any sort is going to be less than perfect. Thus, it's going to scare him off. Um, and so what he's going to do is he's going to want to look for somebody else to fill that position. And because this is effectively a rebound relationship, he is, of course, not dealing with his emotions. He is trying to use the other person as a way to fulfill the fantasy, fulfill the ideal, and thus he is emotionally unavailable to have a real connection with that person. He's having a, a, an emotional connection with the ideal, with the fantasy, with the, the perfect vision of what he wants or what he believes a relationship should look like in his head. And so that is how an emotionally unavailable man can pull away from somebody and then jump into a relationship with somebody else very quickly. This is essentially how all rebound relationships work. But, um, you know, if this was a long-term emotionally unavailable person, this is kind of how they would operate as well, too. And, um, you know, as he pulls away, he might start to, and, and get close to somebody else, that other person starts to seem a little bit less perfect as well, too. But then he starts to look back at the person that he left, and he says, you know, actually that wasn't so bad because the more distance he has, the more possibility there is in that situation. And the more possibility there is in that situation, the less pressure, the less stress, the less scary it is to him in, in certain respects. And so then he might want to come back to that person. Okay, that's how emotionally unavailable, you know, men in this hypothetical circumstance um, kind of float in and out of your life. And so it's really important that you work on your emotional availability yourself if you find this kind of dynamic happening to you. Because again, two emotionally unavailable people will naturally be drawn to one another. They'll naturally end up in a dynamic with one another. You know, by, by being drawn to one another, I don't mean that they'll commit to one another, but they'll be drawn and entwined in an emotional dynamic with one another. And so if you find yourself constantly attracting being drawn to, dating, interacting with emotionally unavailable people, there's probably a part of you that is emotionally unavailable as well too. So it's really important that you learn how to be emotionally available yourself. That is to say, from the emotionally unavailable woman's standpoint, again, not necessarily woman, but just for this example, um, she needs to learn how to connect with the person that's actually there rather than betting on potential, rather than as well, falling in love with the fantasy, with the idea of this person who is, for lack of a better term, not actually investing in the relationship, but is, you know, dropping breadcrumbs along the way. And um, she needs to learn how to validate herself, love herself, and she needs to actually realize that there are probably lots of men out there who would love to have a, an emotionally available, connected relationship with her, but she is not seeing them because they do not 
trigger the same emotional response in her as the emotionally unavailable man does. Because in a certain way, she has confused the anxiety and insecurity that comes with the dynamic that she has with the emotionally unavailable man as a feeling of love. And when you start to do that, when you start to confuse the actual feeling of love with a feeling of anxiety, of insecurity, of uncertainty, that is when you start to really believe that you love an emotionally unavailable man, when really he just makes you anxious, when really he just makes you insecure, when really you are just walking on eggshells around him because you are hoping to get approval from him, validation from him, reassurance from him, um, all of that stuff. And so this is why it is very important for you to do a lot of this deep work, okay? Because if you become emotionally available, emotionally unavailable men will not be drawn to you and you will not be attracted to them. They will be repelled from you or, you know, you just won't find them interesting because you are not in a relationship to feel anxious. You are not in a dating situation to feel insecure. You're there to find love. You're there to find a connection. You're there to find commitment. And you will suddenly find yourself drawn to emotionally available partners who are ready and eager and willing to commit to you. All the emotionally unavailable people will just fade into the background and you will just suddenly have a new selection of people that you are automatically drawn towards, okay? So, um, How's that for a tangent? <laughs> but yeah, that kind of explains the emotionally unavail unavailability dynamic a little bit. Um, you, you go live right now uh, with a great topic right before I'm about to go see my ex. Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry if you missed this, but hopefully you can catch the replay. <laughs> Hi Clay, two months ago, my wife of nine years separated from me because she felt emotionally neglected and controlled in our relationship. We live together for now with kids. Uh, I have improved, how do I show her? Okay, yeah, so if she believes that she was emotionally neglected and that you were controlling, I would just ask, have you done anything to address that? Have you done anything to not neglect her anymore? Have you done anything to be less controlling? Have you done anything to allow her more autonomy? Um, if you have done that, then it should come across in how you are bringing yourself to interactions with her, okay? If this is just you putting on a good act, if this is just you hopefully saying the right things or something like that, it's going to shine through. The truth will shine through and your wife will pick up on it. You know, the two of you were together for nine years. You probably know her pretty well. You can probably read her pretty well. Uh, likewise, she can probably read you pretty well as, as well too. You know, my wife and I have been together for 10 and a half years and I think that we can read each other pretty well and we can tell when we're not being 100% uh, authentic with one another. Uh, so, so I'm pretty sure that that's a similar dynamic between you and your wife. So this has to be a real legitimate change. This has to be something that you can demonstrate to her through how you are bringing yourself to your interactions. Um, because your intentions matter more than what you say or what you do. Your intentions will shine through more so than any words that you say, more so than any actions that you make. If your intentions are of being, um, you know, emotionally mindful of her and uh, considerate of her and um, accepting of giving her freedom to do whatever she wants, then it will come through and you will not need to wonder what are the scripts that I need to say in order for her to get it? What are the magic words that I need to say for her to see me as somebody who's not controlling? Because you simply just won't be a controlling person and everything that you say or do is gonna come from a place of not being controlling, of being more understanding, more compassionate, more uh, generous and all of that stuff, okay? So you really wanna make sure this change is genuine and authentic and this will come through in how you bring yourself to your interactions. You say that you still live with her, so there's probably lots of opportunity for you to demonstrate this to her on a regular basis. Uh, demonstrating a change is the most important thing you can do if you want to save a relationship. This is much more important than, you know, 
talking. This is much more important than talking about how much you've changed by telling somebody how much you've changed because anyone can just talk. Anyone can just talk and say, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a new person. I've changed and all that stuff. That is why begging and pleading, promising up and down that you've changed, uh, swearing that it's going to be different, apologizing a million times, that is why that doesn't work is because it's all talk and no actual demonstration, okay? Uh, the second thing is that you also want to make sure that you are able to sustain this over a long period of time because, you know, your wife doesn't know if she can put her trust into this change yet. She doesn't know if this is just an act that you're putting on, if this is just you on your good behavior, if this is just you trying to get back to the status quo, and then once you're comfortable, it's going to be right back to business as usual. It's going to be, you know, all, hey, all, all this change goes out the window because, hey, I'm comfortable and whatever. I'm just going to go back to my normal way of being. But she's going to need to see consistency over a period of time before she starts to put trust in these changes as being genuine, as being legitimate, as being real. Now, how much time is going to be a big unknown factor. It's going to depend a lot on, um, you know, her personality, kind of the nature of your relationship and the dynamic that it was before and how much you've changed and all that sort of stuff. So I don't really have, uh, you know, a specific time frame that I can give you, but um, it's, going to, it's going to be different for each individual person. But the best way that you can do this is to just keep showing up consistently day after day after day after day after day, demonstrating that you are not the person that she believed that you were when she broke up with you, that you are not controlling, that you are not emotionally neglectful, that you are mindful, that you are compassionate, that you are understanding, that you are patient, that you um, are generous with her, and that you are uh, forgiving, you know, whatever, whatever that might look like for you. And if you start to step into that way of being, she will start to really realize that this is not the same game that she walked out of in the first place, and that will start to really allow her to put more and more and more trust over time into you as the kind of person that you are being in that moment, as the kind of um, compassionate, understanding, generous, forgiving uh, person that you really want her to see you as, okay? So I hope that helped you out. Um, Okay, guys, we're up on time here, so I want to thank you once again for tuning in. We'll probably talk about emotionally unavailability uh, a little bit more in the next couple days, but thank you so much. Please be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. Please be sure to subscribe if you are not already, and if you want to learn more about how to overcome emotional unavailability, please check out modernlove.life class, and here's some more videos for you to check out. Anyway, talk to you next time.